Okay, I'm hoping everyone's doing well. Uh, and I'm just going to give it one more minute, perhaps, and um, then I'm going to kick this off really, really quickly. I'm hoping everyone's been enjoying the session so far with uh, all of the different workshops as well as keynotes that have been going on throughout the day. It's been fantastic and amazingly informative so far. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to what we are going to be having over the rest of today as well as tomorrow. So really, really excited to see all of that and really excited to see all of you guys attending this session. So I'm just going to kick start right away because uh, we, we do have a few different things that we are going to be covering, um, including a demonstration. So if you wish to follow along, of course you can, but um, this is obviously going to be available to you later on as well if you do want to try it out. So uh, with that, I am going to kick this off with a very warm uh, hello and welcome to this session today. I am Buddha, a product evangelist at Tyke, and um, I'm joining you today from all the way from Singapore. So it's, it's kind of evening here. Well, I call it evening. It's kind of towards the night time at this point over here, but I'm hoping you've been having a great day so far. The session that the, the topic for today's session workshop is going to be around managing SOAP, REST, and GraphQL APIs with Tyke and Tyke's Universal Data Graph. Um, I'm going to just go right over to my slides, which I'm hoping you can see. If you at any point of time, if you do have any questions or having any kind of difficulty to, in, in following along or viewing my screen, please feel free to add that to the chat so that I can understand that I, I need to adjust something. As it stands, I can see my slide, so I'm just going to go right on with it. So moving right along, I think the, the, the things that we're going to be covering today is going back a little bit in time uh, in, in taking a look at the different API styles through the ages, a little bit of an introduction into SOAP, REST, and GraphQL, um, then looking, talking about why you might want to actually have a single platform that could manage all of these different API styles and even go further in terms of combining them into a unified data graph. Speaking of which, we are also, as topic number three, we are going to be talking about uh, a little bit on Tyke's universal data graph, what it is, what it can do, and follow that up with a demonstration showcasing how you can not only manage REST, GraphQL, and SOAP-based endpoints with Tyke, but also how you can bring all of that together and combine it into one unified data graph using the Tyke's universal data graph. Um, and at the end, we'll have a time for Q&A. Hopefully, we'll have enough time for that. Uh, I've allocated about 10 minutes for it. But at any point during the session, if you do have any questions or you wish to ask anything to me, uh, by all means, use the chat box and ask, and I will pick those up as soon as the demonstration has been completed. So with that, let's go taking a little trip down memory lane and really looking all the way back into the early days of APIs and cross-service um, communication or cross-system communication, which is where we, we, we land at SOAP. SOAP was simple object access protocol. And really what it did was it made data available as a service. And at the same time, as a pro, it was highly standardized. Therefore, it was fairly predictable in terms of what you would expect in terms of the payload, both during request as well as response. However, it did have a few challenges in terms of inflexibility because you were strictly required to adhere to XML-only formats. And because of that highly standardized nature of the payloads, it could become a bit of a challenge in terms of modifying those payloads to actually accommodate any changes as your business grew. So with that, as we move on to the next stage, we, we, we move on to REST, which is probably, as even today, one of the most popular forms of APIs um, consumption that we have out there. The key difference there in, as compared to SOAP was how it made, it made data available as a resource. It additionally brought in multi-format support, so you were no longer tied down by just XML-only support, but you could make use of JSON formats as well as plain text formats, even if you wanted to go that way. Um, and it made things a little bit more flexible when it came to um, handling your inter-service communication, inter-system communication a little bit better. It did have a few limitations, of course, where it really shown in term where whenever there was a very, very specific requirement and you were requesting for specific resources. However, it did have a tendency over a period of time 
to either get a little bit bloated in terms of having cascading requests coming through where a single REST endpoint was trying to do too many things, or it could also provide you with information which, depending on what kind of consumption platform that you might have, whether that is a mobile application or a web application, it couldn't exactly adjust automatically. And you either had to create multiple different endpoints to cater to all of those different needs, or you had you could fall into the trap of over or under fetching of information as, a, as you made those calls, which then led to the advent of GraphQL. GraphQL makes data available as a graph and was primarily built, it was built in Facebook back, I think, in 2011, if I'm not wrong. It was really built with the purpose of omni-channel application development. And the, the biggest achievement of this was the level of flexibility that it provided when you're trying to query different data sources together and um, still meeting the needs of the evolving um, platforms that you're building your application for, whether you had a mobile application and, and an individual screen required a very specific set of information, you could query that information directly. And at the same time, if, you, if another platform required had a, had a more, more extensive requirement, you could add that on as well. So of course, um, that's, what, that's where GraphQL essentially shines. However, it did have, does, I mean, it still probably has a few limitations when it comes to a bit of lack of tooling as well as knowledge, where you do need to have a little bit of understanding of how, say, GraphQL works. And it, it makes it a little bit harder in terms of getting started and up and running really, really quickly. Um, now, the usual debate as you go along, and as you might have heard in this space, is being whether it's a REST versus GraphQL, which is the right one for you. And I think um, when it comes down to the, the crux of it, it is really, really driven by your use case. In certain, under certain circumstances, REST works perfectly fine. It is the right solution for you. And in certain, under circ certain circumstances, GraphQL is gonna be um, the right solution for you. Like I mentioned, omnichannel application development could be one of those potential solutions out there. Um, it isn't as black and white as to say that GraphQL is the better version of REST. That is actually not true. Um, and on a more personal opinion basis, it actually, from what I believe, it is there is a means of coexistence between both of them. And I think they're going to touch upon a little bit of that today uh, as well in terms of how you can combine these two methods um, to create a more unified format for, for consumption. But at the end of the day, really, it's driven by use case, the right thing always has um, the, the, the problem is going to dictate the solution as opposed to the solution looking for problems. So with that, really what we are going to be talking about today, though, is how you're looking at a single platform, which could help you manage all of these different styles of APIs, so REST, GraphQL, and just to look into not only just managing that and securing it, but also looking at how or how you can actually combine all these different API styles to create that unified experience um, for your application. Now, of course, the question is, why would you want to do that? And there are really three key reasons why you might want to consider it, three key challenges that we want to address by doing this. First is growth. Now, as your, your business evolves, I think your needs of the business also evolves. And therefore, if you have something like a flexible solution, which can essentially cater to these different API styles, it saves a whole lot of, a lot of pain and a whole lot of sleepless nights when it comes to considering your cost of migration, cost of adoption, and you can essentially look at what is it that my business needs at this point of time and evolve accordingly uh, based on your needs, as opposed to having to consistently think or be limited by the amount of resources the amount of money that it's going to cost you to actually make that, that switch. The second is innovation. While growth really looks at as things stand today for your business or your, for your product, innovation is really trying to look at one eye, keep, keep one eye on the horizon in terms of what is really coming up. And once again, having something of a flexible solution that can take care of a lot of these different API styles, along with bringing in a level of customization for you to, to cater for any future needs, I think makes it a lot, lot easier in terms of managing those innovative ideas. It makes running proof of concepts a lot easier, as well as not only once that proof of concept is actually successful, it makes it a lot easier to actually integrate that into your overall platform um, for, for, your, for the benefit of your solution as well as your business. 
So building an API stack piece by piece and working cohesively using something like an API management platform such as Tyke is, is potentially one of the ways that you could really achieve peace of mind when it comes to looking at your business expansion over a period of time. And the final point is really decision making. So of course, now you are catering to all of these API styles, but as a business, you might be looking at or working with multiple different data sources, multiple different systems internally. And the benefit of actually making use or making these systems work cohesively is really getting a lot more beneficial data insights for your business. And that beta, better data insights can really boost the direction of your business and can really power your business growth through better decision making. So that's sort of the purpose. That is what we are trying to tackle using um, today's demonstration. It is really going to be a very, very small sneak preview into what you can actually achieve uh, because we only have about 40 minutes to go through this. But um, but hopefully it's, it's going to give you a bit of an idea about what we are going to we are talking about and how it might be contextualized to your business. Just as a quick introduction into what the universal data graph really is. Um, so this is something that we came up with, I think, over, over the last year. And what it tries to accomplish is to combine multiple APIs or data sources into one universal interface. And it does so as a becoming a central integration point for your APIs through a no-code solution and enables you to build your own data graph powerfully without the need of actually creating custom middleware or writing a whole stack of code that, again, you need to maintain for yourself uh, and really takes care of all of those things for you in a, in a very, very simple yet powerful way. So that's what, that's what the universal data graph is in a single slide or a single, single line. Um, and with all of that introduction, I think it is now time for our main event, which is going to be the demonstration. So I'm going to stop sharing so that I can hop on to my next tab which is, okay, screen share. I am hopefully, so I'm gonna be sharing my entire screen. So you might see a cascading screen coming up shortly as it is. So yeah, that's me into me. Right, uh, back to my slides. Um, so this demonstration, I'm gonna be presenting this. There are gonna be two main parts of this demonstration. The first part of it is how would you go about securing your existing APIs, so existing REST APIs, GraphQL endpoints, and how would you convert your SOAP endpoints into REST endpoints and then treat them as securing your REST APIs as well. Finally, the second half of this, we are gonna be demonstrating the universal data graph where we are gonna be combining these different REST endpoints into a GraphQL endpoint and we're gonna be bringing in SOAP as well that has been, that we converted previously in the first part. So hopefully that is, that's all gonna go smoothly. So prayers to all the demo gods, uh, all fingers crossed um, and, and let's get right onto it. So hopefully you can see my screen and what you see right now is the Tyke dashboard. So once you log in, you into Tyke, you, this is essentially the window that you're presented with. This is, this is the application window. I'm currently looking, using a local installation or on my own machine. You can, by all means, sign up for a free trial, and we are giving away a free trial. If you hop on to our booth, uh, the Tyke booth, we've got a friendly bunch of people manning that booth. So ask your questions or sign up for a free trial in, in no time, and you'll be able to get the benefits of all of this um, on your own um, personal account that, that you should be able to play around with. For the purposes of the first part of the demonstration, I'm going to be showing you how to secure a REST endpoint. Um, and for that, I'm going to be using this particular endpoint, which is essentially getting a whole bunch of information about a user. Uh, the URL, if it's not visible, it's jsonplacehold.typico.com slash users. I am just going to put that on my chat if you want to look at it. And like you, as you can see, it is essentially looking at all of these different information about users. If I want to look at information about a specific user, I can just type slash one and it'll give me uh, information about one particular user. So I'm just gonna go back. And what we're gonna be doing right now is we are gonna be essentially taking this URL, routing this endpoint through the type, um, through the type gateway and adding a layer of security on top of it, which currently does not exist. As you can see, anyone can make a call to this. There is no layer of security that is added to this. Onto my dashboard. 
So on the left-hand side, you will see the section under system management called APIs. So I'm going to click on there. I've got a bunch of APIs out here because I've been playing around a little bit. If you see this as an empty when you first use this account, do not be alarmed. That is how it is supposed to be. We're going to be changing that very, very shortly. So let's let's create our first, add our first API. I'm going to be adding in, I'm going to give it a name. Uh, let's say user rest. And I'm going to change my target URL to be the one from that we just copied. I'm going to start the configuration process. I'm going to quickly start off. I'm going to disable the authentication mode for now, just for the purpose of demonstration. And then I'll put that back in. So don't worry about it. I'm going to save it. I'm going to go back in. So right on the top, at the top, you might be able to see the, the URL, the API URL. I'm just going to copy that. And for the purpose of this demonstration, again, I'm using Postman as my application of choice to um, demonstrate. I'm hoping you're able to see this. Um, please um, shout, give me a shout out if you are unable to see this because I can't make out because I'll be seeing a cascading screen if I go back. So I'm hoping you can see this information. So okay, moving right along, I'm going to go in and add in my URL. And this, if I send in a request, as you can see, you are able to get um, the user is back in, and if I were to add in, say, one, I will be able to get my specific user information, which is for user number one. Now, of course, this doesn't seem very, very different from what we were doing previously, but obviously now, right now what's happening is it is now being routed through the type gateway, the benefit of which you will be seeing very, very shortly. So if I go back now on to um, thanks for the confirmation, Taylor. Yep, you can see it. That's fantastic. Thank you, Francisco. Now we're going to be adding a layer of security. So step one here is I'm going to be changing the authentication mode to authentication token. And that's going to be the method of authentication we are going to be using. I'm going to update my API. And what we're going to be using is something called policies. So of course, in order to authenticate using authentication token, you need keys. And you can obviously create keys for each individual API, which I can do at this point of time because I only am managing one API. However, if you were to manage a multitude of APIs, probably in the tens or even hundreds, then having to manage each individual key for each individual API becomes fairly cumbersome, and it becomes very, very hard to maintain. So as a solution to that, we have introduced this concept of policies, which is essentially, as the name suggests, it creates these, these global rules of engagement, uh, whether that is on the basis of authentication, as well as things like rate limiting, quotas, um, and a whole range of other things which are specific to APIs, which we'll look into um, potentially at a later stage. So I'm going to quickly add a policy. It's a two-step process. I'm going to start off with adding my user rest as my first part. I need to go into configuration. I'm going to call it user policy. Give it an expiration date, let's say one hour. Hopefully that's it's not going to go beyond that. And update. So my policy has now been created. I'm going to go as step two of this, go into my keys. Again, on the left-hand side panel, all of this is very, very visually available, so you should have no issues going through that. I'm going to be choosing my user rest, your user policy, to create this uh, key of mine. So it's already imported all of, the, all of the rules of engagement. I'm going to create my key. So I'm going to copy this back onto Postman. Now, as you could imagine, if I were to send in a request, it is going to stop me because my authorization field is missing. So let's change that and add the authorization field. I'm going to add in my authorization token, and it gives me back my user. So that's how you would go about um, authenticating, securing an existing REST endpoint. And as you can see, it's a very, very straightforward process in order to manage uh, an individual endpoint. So moving right along. Part number one here is going to be, we're going to be looking at now taking a SOAP service, and we're going to be looking to convert that into a REST endpoint. And beyond that, of course, you can add the same rules of security on top of it, but let's get started with it. For the purpose of this demonstration, I am going to be using this web service, which is called a number conversion service. And as the name suggests, it's really converting numbers. There are two options. It converts numbers into words or numbers to dollars. 
The one I'm going to be using is going to be the number two words conversion. So let's get started back into my dashboard. I am going to instead this time of adding new API, I'm going to be importing one. And if you're familiar with SOAP, you might be familiar with WSDL as well, or WSDL, which is a web service development language and or definition language, I think. Um, and I'm going to be importing it using that. First step is what is the upstream target? That is the URL right on top. I'm just going to copy that back in here. And in the body, what I'm going to be looking at is the service description. So if I go into my service description, it gives me a bunch of XML. I'm just going to copy all of that and paste it here and generate my API. So as you can see, it's automatically generated the number conversion API for me. I'm going to go right in. And there's an authentication method right now. Where I'm going to go next is this third tab on top. If you can see it, it is called the endpoint designer. And as you can see, it's imported both of those number two dollars and number two words endpoints. Uh, I'm going to be working primarily with the number two words um, endpoint here. So I'm just going to open this up. One thing you might have noticed is that this path seems to have an additional number conversion to that. I can change that very, very simply by just removing number conversion from the relative path, and it makes it a little bit cleaner. Again, not a mandatory step, but just, just so you know, that is a possibility that you can do as well. As a next step, I need to add in two plugins. One is going to be body transform, and the second one is going to be modify headers. Now, these plugins are all automatically available to anyone who is using Tyke. So there's, there is no need for actually pulling in a new new plugin. It's, it's batteries included um, with, with our installation. Um, and there is no real need for customizing the code per se, unless you have to make some, some, some really big different changes here. So I'm going to be looking at body transformation first. And what this is going to do is essentially enable me to modify or, or transform, transform the XML bodies into, into JSON, essentially, for my requests and my, and my response or vice versa. So if I look, go back into my web service, number two words, I will see here, if I just zoom in a little bit so that you can view it, that there is a way of actually putting a request. So the first half is essentially the way you would make a request. So let me copy that. I'm going to paste it here. And if you look here, if you look closely, there is one element here which is called ubinum or the unsigned long. And this is essentially what the service is going to look at um, in terms of a number value, which is going to be converted into word. So that's the thing that I need to change. So I can, of course, hard code this to something like 35, and then it'll just re repetitively give me 35. It's going to convert it. But of course, you want to make things dynamic. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using a Go template here. For that, just follow along. Double brackets open, dot number two convert. So this is a variable. Again, this is not specified anywhere. This is a variable of my own choosing. You can choose your own variable. Um, but of course, do remember this variable because this is what you're going to be using to make your request to this web service when we go back into Postman. If you want to test out the dynamic nature of this, we can do that very, very quickly. Let's say number to convert. Imagine this is essentially mocking up the respond the request that we're going to be sending into this web service. And if I were to now say 25, it will dynamically change that ubinum into the number 25, as you can see over here. So that is what our intention was. On to response. Now, the response, the expected input type is going to be XML. That is what we're going to be getting back. And if we do a quick inspection in terms of what kind of response we're getting is there is a structure to this, um, which is envelope, body, number two words response, and number two words result. So it has to adhere to that when we are converting this. What we're expecting as a template, it needs to be JSON formatted. So I'm going to say, again, give it a variable of my choosing. So I'm calling it converted. And I'm going to use a template here. So if you remember the hierarchy of it, we've got envelope, body. If I go back again, I would be able to see number two words response. And number two words result. I'm going to close this bracket. So it's essentially going to get, take me all the way down through this branch into the string value, which, what we, which is what we're interested in, because that is going to be the response 
that is going to be the converted response of the number we sent in previously. So that's what we are after. So going back in, so that is all we need to do. I think we do need to close our bracket. So do not forget that. Next is going to be modify headers. In this, I need to make sure that the request that is going in is going to be of the content type XML, as you would expect. So I'm going to explicitly mention that text slash XML. And my response is going to be of type JSON. So that is going to be application JSON. I'm going to add that in as well. I'm going to update this. And hopefully, I'm going to copy this in now, this URL, API URL. If you remember, we did that the first time. On to Postman, I'm going to open up a new tab and add this in as a URL. Of course, this is not enough. We want to go into numbers to words. So I'm just going to go into number to words. Change the get to post, which is web service works on post in this case. And I'm going to be adding in a payload for my request. And as you recall, what we were using was number to convert. I'm hoping I've got the spelling correct. And if I were to put in 35 and cross my fingers and pray to the demigods that this is going to be all right, it is going to give me back converted as 35. And of course, you can change that up to anything, say 100, and it automatically does it. So as you can see right now, we've essentially taken a SOAP service, we've converted that into REST, and we're making a request basically to a REST endpoint at this point. Um, without really having to think too much about it. And we did this in less than 10 minutes, I believe, if I'm keeping track of time. It is that simple. And beyond this, you can take this and, and you can secure it. You can add version control. You can add rate limiting and a whole range of things and um, to add to it without really having to um, customize all of these things or build up those middleware and codes that you might have to do otherwise. So great, conscious of time. I'm going to be moving right along. This is... Two parts completed. We are moving on to the third segment of this, which is looking at a GraphQL endpoint and how you can go about securing that. So back into my APIs, I'm going to be adding a new API. This time, I'm going to be choosing GraphQL. I'm going to call it Countries um, GraphQL Demo. And as you can see, I'm going to be using this called Countries Trevor Blades API. Um, what it does, it gives me a whole bunch of information around um, countries information, and we'll we'll inspect that very very shortly. So I'm just going to configure this. Once again, I'm just going to start off with a keyless protocol um, and save it. Going back in, we do have another cool thing that we have presented here, which is uh, an API playground. So I can enable that, update it, and now instead of using Postman, we can specifically use our GraphQL playground, if I can spell it appropriately. Uh, I think I might not have spelled it appropriately, have I? I haven't saved it. Okay, give me one more moment. Uh -huh. We have the demo, we have playground, and there we go. Just needs a bit of a save. So here we go, we've got the playground in. And I'm going to quickly write a query. If you want, if you're curious in terms of the things that you can do, there is documentation available here, but it also enables uh, auto completion. So I'm going to go into country, give it a code. Let's call it SG, Singapore code. Um, I'm interested in the name of the country. I'm interested in the capital of the country. I am interested. This is an interesting one emoji, which is essentially actually giving you information about the flag. So I'm going to do that as well. And perhaps I'm also interested in the continent to which it belongs. So I'm going to give the continent a name. Very here. So if everything goes well, as you can see, it gives me all of this information. I've been able to query um, the, the data source using Tyke as my gateway. Of course, we want to, again, secure this information. Right now, it's an open API. So let's go back and do that. We're going to change this into authentication token, very similar to begin with, as we had done with our REST endpoint, going back into policy, creating a new policy, um, using the countries. I'm going to call it country. I'm 
which creating policies for, for countries was this easy, but okay, we will leave those to APIs and politicians otherwise. Um, onto, onto the keys, I'm gonna add one using this newly created policy. And I should be able to get my key now. If I go back to my playground, of course, if I've make, made a request, it's gonna give me, it's gonna bar me from doing that. Um, so in order to make it happen, I need to add in my authorization header. Now, hopefully, it is going to give me back my my, my country. It's going to give me back Singapore. Um, then after this, I think the next part, there are a couple of additional things that you can also do with this. So of course, um, if we go back into our policy, there is something called uh, query depth limiting. Now, what does that actually entail? So as you can see, I can make a few different queries going into the depth of my, my, my query here. So when it comes to continent, I can also try looking into the countries within this continent and ask for the name of said countries. And each of these countries might also have continents associated with it. And I can go ahead and ask for a name of that. So of course you can keep going on and on if you do not have any restrictions. And while it feels innocuous to begin with, it can be a huge burden on the server. It could be treated as an attack and it could be malicious in nature as well. So if I look at it, as you can see, it would take me a little bit longer to essentially give me a response. And the further and deeper I go, there'll be more information that is trying to pull and combine from. So in order to prevent this from happening, I can go back here. And if I look at my global limits, there is this thing called query depth limiting. Right now it's unlimited. I'm going to remove this. And I'm going to say maximum query depth is going to be three. And what does that actually mean? If you look at it right now, the depth of this query, and one of the tricks to do that could be just counting the number of open brackets uh, and subtracting the closed ones. But uh, here we go, we've got one, two, three, four, and five. So we have five levels in. So if I were to make a request now, it is gonna tell me that the depth has been exceeded. So if I now want to get back my information, I'm gonna remove two of these depths and I should be able to get back my response. So that's, that's one of the additional uh, mechanism of, of securing your GraphQL endpoint, because of course it's not like a regular endpoint as REST because you obviously have your endpoint itself, but you also have to look into um, the, the data layer of it, which is where most of the things tend to happen with GraphQL. There is one more thing, which is around the field depth limiting, if they, and this comes into existence all the way down here. You see field-based permissions, if I enabled it, We'll see all of these different fields that are right now available to me. And if, for instance, I do not want um, anyone to check out the, the emoji or the flag information, then I can add that as a restriction and it's going to prevent me if I'm making that request um, off of my API, just like this. So there you go. These are two very specific ways in which you can um, secure your, your API, specifically your GraphQL endpoint. And uh, well, with that, we come to an end to part one where we were looking to secure in our existing um, endpoints, whether that is SOAP, REST, or GraphQL. Now, on to the more exciting part of it, where uh, we are going to be looking at a universal data graph. And what we're going to be looking to do is we're going to be looking to combine two different REST endpoints into the and, and create a GraphQL uh, schema out of it, as well as looking to take that. SOAP endpoint that we created and add a little bit more flavor to it. So you were effectively trying to manage all of these different API styles and combining this information for hopefully better data insights or any other purpose that you might, your, your context or your specific use case might dictate. So let's go on. I'm going to be adding a new API here. Um, I'm going to call it the combined um, graph demo. GraphQL, but instead of proxying to an existing GraphQL service, I'm going to be treating this as a universal data graph and composing a new GraphQL service using this. So I'm going to go to configuring API. Just going to get rid of authentication again. I think by now you've already seen how that works. I'm just going to save this and go back in here. Um, inside, I'm going to go straight into my schema. As you can see, there is there is option for mutation and query. We are not going to go into mutation today, um, but if you're interested, I'll be happy to have a chat about it. But for now, we're going to be dealing with queries. 
And what we're going to be doing is, if you remember the very, very first example that we had of a REST endpoint, we had this user information. And what we're going to try to do is replicate this. As you can see that we've got a lot of different um, fields here. So I'm not going to be replicating each one of them. I'm just going to be taking three to begin with. So let me go back in and create. We always start off with a type. Um, so I'm going to call it user. And this is going to give me, I want three fields. So there's going to be ID, name of type string, and email. Right, string. In terms of my query, I want to get my user. And that is going to be based on ID. And it's going to be of type user as well. So now if this is all OK, and I were to update this, it should. So this is essentially what's going to happen. Um, this ID here is essentially an argument. So when I make a request, I can call for a very specific user like we have done previously. I'm going to my data sources. As you can see, it's already taken this in. What I need to do is to specify the data source for this get user, which is going to be my REST endpoint. So clicking on it will open up my data model. This is all fine. I'm going to go into my data source next and define my data source. It's going to be a REST endpoint. And the URL, I can choose right from here. And URL. So, and my method is going to be get. Now, one thing you might have noticed here is that if I were to put this as a URL, it is essentially hard coding my user ID to one and one only. What we want instead is for it to be dynamic in nature. So once again, if you remember how we had handled that in SOAP, it is going to be a code template. I'm going to have my open brackets in here, and I'm going to add arguments.id. So arguments, essentially, whatever you add in as an argument, like we saw during the editor, in this case, it's going to be ID. I'm going to be taking that, sending it off to my REST endpoint, and it's going to give me back my response, hopefully, if everything goes well. I'm going to update the field and update my API. And we also have this internal playground, which is what I'm going to be using now. I can showcase that for you. And I'm going to create this query. My user, I want ID to be 1. Let's begin with 1. I've got my ID here, I've got my name here, and I've got my email here. Hopefully, everything goes well. I've got my first user. And of course, the, being dynamic in nature, if I change it to four, I'll get my user number four as well information here. So as you can see, I've created this essentially within a span of about five minutes, where I've taken a REST endpoint and converted that into GraphQL without having to really look into any kind of code uh, whatsoever, any kind of middleware whatsoever. Now, um, what I can do, I can take this one step further and add in not just one REST endpoint, but potentially a second one. So let's look at the second one. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm actually going to be using my SOAP service that I had converted into REST and add that in. This is, again, just for the demonstration purpose. So it is a fairly simplistic sort of an example. But you can look into more complex examples as well. So as you can remember, it is a converter. So I'm going to call it type converter. And the value here to be converted. Not the most creative of names, but I guess it does the job. It's going to be added to my user object. And I'm going to call this field converted ID. It's going to return type converter. I have got these all correct. Uh, am I making a mistake here? I think there is a red somewhere. No, this is correct. Get user is correct. User user is fine. Uh, Ah, oh, yes, my type is wrong. OK, there you go. I need to have a converted type, which is going to be string. So that should be that. If I go back to my data source. Hopefully, it has imported all of that information for me. And now I need to marry my converted ID with the correct data source. So I'm going to follow the same rules. In this case, my data source is going to be REST. And I'm going to be copying my number conversion URL be my endpoint method is going to be post. And of course, in this case, again, we have to replicate. If you remember here, replicate this body 
that we had previously. So I'm going to go in here and say number to convert. And what I'm going to be doing is actually I'm going to be taking the ID, which is a numerical field, and converting that into string. Again, not the not the most extensive sort of an example per se, but it, it sort of demonstrates what the capability is here um, that we are trying to accomplish. So I'm going to say object.id. And I'm using object in this case because the ID is part of the user object as opposed to an argument which we had used at the query level. So two different levels here. At the query level, you use arguments. At the, at the level of an object, you use object.id. So hopefully, this is going to be all good. I'm going to update this field. Um, up, hit update here and refresh. My schemas are all fine. My data source is all good. So I should be able to go into my playground and say converted ID, converted. And that is going to give me, hopefully, the number four, because that is the ID that we're going after. So as you can see, we've done REST, we've done SOAP to REST, and now REST has now been converted into GraphQL. There is one last part that I'm going to go really, really quickly, just a couple more minutes, where we've done two. We're going to go into one last part where we look at a to-do list of users, where we look at a slash to-do thing. It gives you a title and it gives you a completed status. And we're going to import that in as well. So we're essentially managing three different endpoints together um, and bringing it all in with the universal data graph here. So I'm going to go back to my schemas. By now, you should be fairly familiar with it, hopefully. I'm going to give it the type to do, give it user ID, user ID, type ID, um, gives me a title, type string, spell, and a status, which is completed. It's going to give me a string as well. I'm going to add this to my user, and it is going to be to do's. And the difference here is going to be this is, needs to be an array of information, an array of objects from the to do. So, in order to do that, just have the square brackets open, and it's going to be returning me a type to do. Onto my data source, I will go into my to do's once again. You can see it is a list. Define my data source. Excuse me. And now I can actually use a predefined data source template as well. So I'm just going to use my first one where we had the slash users go and change my argument into object because, as you can see, it is under users. And I'm going to add in my slash to do's as dictated by the actual URL here. So with that, I am going to update my field and hit update here. Quick refresh to make sure everything is in order. And now, if I go into my playground and make a call to to-dos with the title and the completed status, it should give me all of the different to-do lists for this. So this is essentially taking in two REST endpoints, one SOAP service, converting to REST, and creating this GraphQL um, schema out of it combining all of this information. So effectively, if you think, if you wanted to think about it, you're essentially trying to look at the past, present, and future of your APIs, of your API business, and managing it all through this one platform um, called Tyke. So with that, I bring this session to an end, uh, the, bring this demonstration to an end. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go back in here and look up if there are any specific questions that anyone would want to ask. Um, in, in order to take things forward. So if there are any, any specific questions that you would want to ask here. Um, I am going to, okay, what else would you be able to do with, through your policies and managing API? So, okay, this is an interesting one. So I think I alluded to this a little bit earlier on where we looked at um, simply securing APIs, but the role of an API management platform goes a little bit beyond it. So you can not just secure things, but you can also look into things like version control. You can start looking into things as rate limiting, and you can also start looking into things like quotas. Uh, each of them have specific use cases, and you will be using them under certain circumstances. Um, if you're looking at a quick view of how that might work, hopefully, 
I should be able to share my screen really quickly. And I can go in, let's say, my REST endpoint, which was the user REST. And as you remember, it was giving me a list of users. If I go into my policy around it, which is the user policy, we will see that there is a global limit and quota that is associated with it. And in here, you would see a few different things that you can do here. One is rate limiting, one is throttling, one is quotas. Now, rate limiting and quotas can be a little bit sim similar in, its, in, in what they're trying to accomplish. Rate limiting on one end is really looking, as the name suggests, it's kind of um, giving you the number of API calls that you can make um, in a specific span of time. In this case, it is usually seconds. Whereas quotas can give you a little bit longer in terms of time frames. Um, quotas typically are utilized when you are looking at things like your API monetization strategy, for instance, um, and that might be a part of it. Rate limiting is a little bit more of a server management or load management strategy, but again, it can be used either or depending on how you want to deal with it. Um, so right now what I can do is I can enable this and add say, for purpose of demonstration, three requests can be made over a period of 10 seconds. And I'm gonna update this. If I were to go back into Postman, into my REST endpoint, if I can find it, which was already secured, did we? Yeah, we are already secured with this one. And I think hopefully if I were to make three requests in a short time, it will give me a rate limit exceeded. So obviously, because the time frame is 10 seconds, at the end of 10 seconds, it will refresh once more. So I think once 10 seconds is done, which I think it is, I will be able to get back my responses again. So it is really looking at a time frame and not really a whole range of different uh, API calls bombarding your servers. So by no means is this an exhaustive way of uh, managing your load over the servers. You can also obviously look into cached queries and a lot of different other things um, that would aid in this methodology, but this could be one of the mechanisms by which you take care of those issues. Okay, a little bit of a thing there. I am gonna go back and see if there is a question. Okay, so question is, is it possible to configure it in code instead of only in UI and easily roll up configuration to a new type instance? Great question, thank you for that. Um, yes, absolutely. So I think I didn't go into the details of how Tyke is sort of structured in interest of time, but the way Tyke works is we have an open source Tyke gateway that essentially powers our Tyke dashboard as well as the developer portal. So the dashboard is what you just saw. Um, the developer portal is where you would essentially be exposing your APIs um, such that it is available for consumption for by third party developers or partners, but all of it is essentially being powered by our Tyke gateway, which is open source. So, and you can hook onto that in whichever way you want. Um, you can use a command line to hook into it. Um, if you're looking at um, essentially adding configurations and things like that, and really easily spinning up instances as you go along, we do have a few more components that aid in that, one of which would be our Tyke sync capability. The other one is our new capability that we have brought in, which is called the Tyke operator which really starts has started looking into how um, you can use de declarative API uh, APIs, especially around Kubernetes and, and managing that stack a little bit better. Uh, it's brought in a whole new range of uh, developer experience in terms of how easy it is to manage all of these and configuring all of these in um, non-UI format and can really, really easily form part of your API governance strategies or your CI CD pipelines or your GitOps strategy as well. So that's a very long winded way of saying, yes, it is very much possible. Our, our gateway that is powering everything that you see is, is open source and readily available for your consumption. Um, so you can do all of that. I hope I, hope I managed to answer your question, Dimitri. Um, I think we are, we've just got one more minute. Um, so if anyone has any one final questions to ask, by all means, shoot. Um, but even if it's something that clicks later on, we are going to be available at our booth. We've got a lovely bunch of people manning the booth, uh, including uh, consulting engineers, solution architects, product evangelists such as myself, account managers, and everyone's uh, there readily available 
fun bunch of people ready to talk, ready to chat. Uh, any questions around API management um, or Tyke or GraphQL or API styles, it's all available. Um, come in, hang out with us. Uh, we'll love to have chat and hear from you. So I think we've just gone 50 minutes past. Um, so with that, I would say thank you very much, everyone who's been part of this uh, workshop. I hope you found this a little bit useful. I hope it managed to intrigue you, interest you, motivate you, inspire you a little bit. Um, so do, by all means, try and see if this is something that you're interested in. Drop by our booth and we'll set you up with a, with a quick trial so that you can try and test this out for your purposes and benefit. So thank you so much. Um, this is Buddha once again signing off and hope you have a lovely rest of the conference. And I'll be coming to you again tomorrow with a round table around key considerations for uh, architecting API management solutions. Um, I'll be jo joined by the lovely Yara Letts, who is our partner consulting engineer as well. So hope to see you then. Till then, take care and see you soon.